right, good evening and welcome as everybody has taken their seats. My name is David Gibson. I'm director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University, just a block away, the Lincoln Center campus. We're your host for this evening's event, our short documentary, The Shaker Legacy, just 10 minutes or so, and, um, and followed by a panel discussion to talk further about the Shaker legacy. I want to thank um, uh, both Lacey Schutz, who will be on the, uh, on the panel, director of the Shaker Museum, one of our partners in this venture, and also Lincoln Center Theaters. This is the first time that we at the CRC have been able to have an event here at the, these theaters. And it's, it's a beautiful space. They're terrific partners and a great host, and we thank them very much and look forward to future collaborations. It's a, it's a really wonderful setting. I um, also just want to note, <laughs> I'm just walking in here, and I was saying this to so many other people, um, it's so great to be here in person with you all. And yeah, it really is. And to be in a space like this, and in a cultural space, uh, and on a night like this, a really chilly fall night, this is the perfect evening for an event and a gathering and a discussion like this. And it's only possible because you're all vaccinated and you're doing the right thing and you're wearing masks. And unfortunately, we can't emphasize that enough, but I want to explicitly thank you all uh, for doing that and essentially making this possible, so thank you. You know, we see this, uh, I, I see this event also um, as part of our, as a privilege to do this kind of thing, to be with you and to do this sort of thing, but also part of our mission, I think especially now, to help rebuild the cultural life of New York City and New York State to, to you know, let's hope we're emerging from this tunnel in some way, but we really need to support cultural institutions. We need to be part of and to rebuild the cultural life of New York City and New York State. And so that's really what I see as our mission. That's where I see these kinds of events, especially things that happen even off campus from Fordham as, as doing a very much. Um, you know, it's, it's, this kind of thing is critical to our, our community to our, our common future. Um, and that kind of community was also the, is also really the, the central theme of the, the short film you're about to see. Um, so we, we not only wanted to um, provide a space and a platform for cultural life in New York City, but Fordham also wants to, and the CRC kind of wants to provide a, a concrete contribution to a degree um, to cultural life through some original content, as they say in the media business, some original programming, some original um, uh, uh, elements like this, like this film. Now the genesis, just real briefly, the genesis of this idea came when I saw a story in Fordham News about uh, Catherine Reckless, my colleague in the Department of Theology, and a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation that she and others had received to do work on the legacy of the Shakers. And it really piqued my interest. In a way, it was, um, it was kind of the perfect topic. When I first came to Fordham four years ago, I'm a career journalist, and as I always say, this is honest work for the first time in my life. Um, and I came here, and I'd done, you know, I was mainly a print reporter and journalist, and I, but I'd done a number of documentaries for CNN, History Channel, some other places, and they're always fun to do, and I kind of toyed with the idea of doing a documentary, some sort of documentary project within budget, maybe the short documentary that so many outlets are experimenting with, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and this really seemed like the perfect topic uh, because it's religion and culture. Um, it's uh, highlighting the work of our Fordham colleagues. Uh, and it's also very much uh, highlighting the cultural life of New York City 
and New York State and really forming those bonds, being, you know, making Fordham solidify those bonds with the rest of the cultural community out there. So really it was, it was a perfect idea. And then the pandemic came along and we couldn't do in-person events and that kind of turbocharged the whole idea of doing a, a documentary, the kind of thing that we can show here in a theater setting, in a communal setting, but also that we can put online and have out there so that other institutions, other anybody, any teacher, anybody out there can use this brief documentary as a starting point for a conversation, a deeper conversation about the Shakers, about religion, about the United States, about our history. That's really what we want to do. Um, there are a lot of hurdles, as there always are, in any uh, creative endeavor, um, but finally, here we are. So in a moment, uh, we're going to show this documentary, this, this uh, short doc. After that, we'll gather our panelists on stage here, discuss some of the topics raised by this. We also want to invite your questions. Uh, please, you know, we'll, we'll pipe up one by one, and I'll, I'll call on you. Um, so we invite you to take part in this conversation as well. But right now, please sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. Again, thank you all very much. Let me briefly introduce uh, my fellow panelists here um, and co-workers on this project, I feel. Catherine Reckless, to my right, is an associate professor of theology at Fordham University. Um, she writes on a range of topics from modern Protestant theology to religion and pop culture. Her most recent book is Protestant Aesthetics and the Arts, which she co-edited with Sarah Covington. Um, Catherine is terrific. She has a regular uh, gig for the Christian Century and wrote recently on um, uh, the movie The Eyes of Tammy Faye, which we also screened uh, up here recently. Um, then we have uh, next to her is Courtney Bender, a professor of religion at Columbia University who specializes in contemporary American religion. Courtney is completing a book, or is it complete? On, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, Where's that manuscript? <laughs> She's completing a book, it will be completed at some point, on modernist visions of the future of religion that developed in 20th century architectural and planning projects. And Courtney, you may have seen in that brief uh, shot of uh, the Zoom conversation we had a year ago now on the Shakers, which you can find on our, on our website, on our YouTube page, um, contributed there. Um, Lacey Schutz is the executive director of the Shaker Museum, as well as the historic Shaker site in New Lebanon, New York. The, uh, she's working on developing, as you saw there, the per museum's permanent new facility, which will be in uh, Chatham, New York. And Lacey is clearly not as cold now as she was during the filming of this project, <laughs> which uh, took place in that you know, as we called it, that converted cow barn, which has no heat source. <laughs> and you are all very uh, terrific to uh, put up with all of that. Um, so, uh, and I'm happy to take feedback on the film as well. Uh, any thoughts that any of you have technically? What, what did you think? Did you see it beforehand? I, I, watched, I watched it really, really briefly yesterday. Yeah. And I really liked it. And I well, noticed that I say the word totally a lot. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> well, it's, like, it's, like my, it's like my daughter, you know, telling when she uses the word like, like all the I, time. I really am a millennial, I guess. <laughs> well, my students remind me, though, they're like, not old like a millennial, which is what they say to me. They're like, I'm not, not, I'm not talking about like an older person, like a millennial. And then I just like crawl under my desk. That is funny. <laughs> Well, I just, it was, um, it was really great to see this because I feel like, uh, you know, I often get so um, wrapped up in things like budget forecasts and answering emails that sometimes I, I forget to step back and think, God, the shakers were amazing. So this was a, this was a, actually I got a little, I got a little uh, verklempt watching it because I just like, oh yeah, this is, this is so cool. This is what I do is really cool. <laughs> and while we're at it, just, because um, again, we're just so pleased to do this. And, and again, these kinds of things, you know, I think, um, especially in this day and age with millennials or what, uh, what are the younger ones? What's Gen Z. Gen Z, sorry. Um, you know, uh, 
these are the kind of things that they're going to watch on their phones. You know, short content that we hope can go as uh, be as um, viral as possible. But it's always an opening. You know, Ken Burns, I think in 80, 1984, did a uh, you know an hour long shaker thing. But you know, really, we wanted to focus in on on um, a couple of aspects of the shakers and really have it be an opening to uh, a, a remarkable episode in American cultural religious history. Um, but we were, again, really just excited about the Shaker Museum project, Lacey. How, how is that going? What's the, and it was great. Uh, you may have seen in the Times, just, we were just able to get a couple renderings in here, which they released in the Times, New York Times did an article a couple months ago. How's, that, how's it progressing? Yeah, it's it's great. Um, we uh, I'm not sure it was totally obvious from the film, but we've been working with Annabelle Seldorf um, and her team, and you know they're just it's an amazing firm with great museum bona fides. Uh, they're working on the Frick renovation right now, and um, they're going to be doing the National Gallery in London. So we feel like we're in really really good company. So um, and it's just it's been it's been amazing to work with somebody who really understands sort of museums and where they're headed and cultural spaces and how to how to kind of have community in in these kinds of spaces. Um, and we're we're you know COVID in a way um, put a put a little bit of a damper on a lot of our activities, but it allowed us to really really hunker down with the architectural team and our internal team and our building committee um, and think about what we want out of this space and think about what a 21st century museum really looks like and how do you build community around a cultural space. So uh, we're getting to the end of that process of sort of planning and getting drawings for the buildings and things like that. And this, this loose uh, uh, uh project was really seeing, you had so many contemporary artists who were looking at the Shaker inspiration through a contemporary lens. In, in the future museum, we'll, we'll have a contemporary aspect to it as well, not just, you know, you'll have exhibits that will highlight things like that rather than just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We have um, two major exhibition spaces in the building, and one is devoted to a permanent exhibition that kind of talks about you know, the history of the Shakers. Uh, and then there's a, there will be a rotating space that we can do all kinds of different programming in, you know, contemporary art, um, other kinds of, uh, of exhibitions too. Courtney, what, um, you know, what drew you to the Shakers? I mean, is this something, you're a professor of religion, is this something that was uh, part of your early research or is this something you came to later? I was just summoned by Catherine. This is, I think, um, I, well, I, well, actually, Catherine, I, I, your comments about the Amish in the, um, in the film, I grew up um, researching, actually, my early research with the Amish and the Mennonites. So I think there is, despite your pushing back, there's a, sort of an interesting, um, my own interests in um, American religion is really, and that what the Shakers say so much, have so much to say about, is experimentation in ways of life um, that are, you know, go against or are countercultural in some ways, even though they also also fit in in some ways. And, um, you know, learning and thinking, I think the Shakers are a really interesting example. Many um, religious groups that have um, prospered as you know, working against norms of culture with gender and family and racial relations and so on, don't actually have super good, even though they prosper, they, the ends can sometimes be rather violent or um, uh, <laughs> troubling. Um, and the Shakers are, provide a story that not, I mean, we, we wish perhaps that there were more around still, or maybe we don't. I don't know if we do, but um, you know, the end of the Shakers also is as interesting as its beginning, I think, and that's why um, I really have enjoyed being part of this project. So I've been teaching now about the Shakers, and they are going to love this documentary. My students, um, they are. It, that's great to hear, and mm -hmm. I, it really is a good point. There are so many good points that, that kind of came up that were worthy of discussion. But what you say. You know, especially upstate New York, the burnt over district, all of that. There, but there's so many utopian communities or cult things that kind of wound up in a cult, like bad ending, exploitative, abusive. Um, the Shakers, you know, they died out, if you want to put it that way. But they didn't really seem to go that way. It, it was, it was a genuine community that, you know, didn't last, but did last, you know, 150 years. But it. Uh, 
did not go the way that so many others did. Yes, you're right. It, it did not. Um, and I'm not sure if we actually should speak about the Shaker's ending because there are living Shakers, and I just want to. True. That's. Um, and I, I have to say Sorry. one thing about, but it, no, it's a very good point, and it's something I wanted to bring up. When you look at other, uh, my old colleagues at Religion and Ethics News Weekly did a piece on the Shakers a few years back. Everybody um, who does a piece on the Shakers now goes up to Sabbath Day Lake in Maine, which is the last community of Shakers, but there are two or three Shakers there. And we didn't want to do that. was out of our... You know, we, we wanted to focus on this, on a New York State project, on the Shaker Museum. <clears throat> but I also, you know, actually there's something about um, just the way people go up there and just talk to two or three Shakers that seems to reduce Shakerism to a couple of people, like you found a, an old, you know, a, a bird species that you thought was extinct or something. Whereas, uh, you know, I think... Uh, what we wanted to do here was focus on the legacy, the larger legacy of both communal life and design. And, um, and, and I think that was a, a good decision, rather than sort of seeing it as this kind of couple of quirky people. But I have a question, maybe Catherine, what do you think, or, or Lacey? Can you actually have Shakerism if there is just one or two? You know, the gospel says where two or three are gathered, <laughs> there I am. But Shakerism is so much about a, a community. Well, I, I, Catherine, you probably have thoughts about this too, but I, I want to point out that it's not, it's not just, there are two formal Shakers, but there is a whole community around them, and that's really what makes it vibrant, is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a core community that is gathered around um, Sabbath Day Lake, and they actively worship together, and they, they work on the farm together. So it, it's, you know, the idea that there isn't an active community is just, it's not accurate. But, um, uh, you know, I also really like to make the distinction between Sabbath Day Lake as, as you know, an active religion, and we're a museum. So, you know, we have very different, you know, we're sort of interpreting the past in a certain way, and they're, they're, um, uh, they have an active community. But I don't know, Catherine, you might want to talk a little bit about how they <coughs> believe they will carry on. Yeah, oh, I was just thinking <laughs> that. I was thinking about, um, well, one, I mean, one of the things that I learned a lot in doing this project um, was how much the Shakers also changed over time. We, 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 we tend to think of them fixed in one particular moment, like making those chairs. But... Um, in, in every way, as a community, in terms of the material culture they lived with, right? They they changed and developed. They took on, like as I said in the film, right? But they took on new technological advancements. They experimented with fad diets and new agricultural practices. Um, so they were a living community for the whole 150 years that they were a really a larger presence. Um, and I, and I love what you said, too, because I think that the, the Shakers, my understanding, though I don't know them personally, my understanding is that they are, the, the living Shakers, right, are, um, you can go to their website and read about this, right? They have a kind of missionary sense. They are waiting for new people who might be called to sign the covenant and to join the community faithfully. So they don't believe that work is necessarily over. Um, and they have a very robust as you said, community of, of sort of lay people or people who haven't signed the covenant but who are living in this sort of spirit of Shakerism. But they also have a really fascinating theology, which we talked a lot about as a group, um, right, where because, because the Shakers who've died physically are still with the community spiritually. And at a certain moments in Shaker history, there are particular moment in the 19th century, but the theology persists, right, that the line between the living and the dead can be quite permeable. And um, Shakers who are of past can give spirit messages, can um, give words of encouragement, can um, show up and give spiritual gifts to living members. And that doesn't happen, in my understanding, happened really in an intense period of time, but that theologically they're still there and that... Um, with with the living shakers, that the community persists, and also maybe more radically that um, right the belief that God won't ever abandon the community, and so even if all the living shakers were dead or seemed to be gone, um, that at some point the spirit of God would renew that movement, right? Because they're millennial, right? They believe that they will persist until 
the end of time or until God's fulfillment of, of God's plan. So there's something really, really unique about that theology. Um, we talked a lot about like what does it mean to be in a land that the, the people who's, who theologically, who occupied it theologically think right, this, they might still be there, right, or that this land will persist as um, kind of as their own until God's fulfillment, even if there aren't any physical shakers there. So I think there's lots of... Yeah, yeah the, that came right in, in the film, the, the last shots when we're, or in the first shots when we're over within the drone over Mount Lebanon. I just, these ideas that we talked about, about the presence, the continued presence of um, the departed, <laughs> it's like flooding up in my in my in my memory, thinking, "Wow!" And right, yeah. so and and the Mount Lebanon space and um, is just such a special. Um, I don't. I mean, I'm not a very like deeply mystical person, but there is a sort of feeling of that space and with that architecture that um, does feel like something is being summoned there. I think mm -hmm. it's. Yeah. I also wonder. I mean, I, I appreciate those points you're you're bringing up about the the Shaker legacy. I got my. My Commonweal uh, uh, magazine in the mail today to give a shout out to our colleagues. Um, and it's, the cover is the varieties of religious community today. And, um, you know, what you said about Sabbath Day Lake, I mean, you know, maybe we don't have shakers in the exactly strict form that we want to envision them. And maybe we don't even have people who call themselves shakers, but there are a lot of vibrant and healthy communities, religious, spiritual, uh, that it organized themselves in very different ways, but might be manifestations of that same American impulse? Does that, does that seem true? <laughs> or no? Like, mm. I'm going to leave that one to the religion scholars. <laughs> I think one of the things I was thinking about when we were talking about the you know good communities, um, good utopic communities <laughs> yeah. that don't end Bad up in ones. like sex or sex abuse scandals or um, violent dissolution, and I was and I was thinking I think you know the, the things Lacey was saying on the film about um, gender equality. I think there's that that um, there's probably no way to like maybe overemphasize mm -hmm. both how radical it was and also maybe why certain kinds of really pernicious hierarchical instincts couldn't develop or didn't develop within Shakerism because of this emphasis on gender equality. And um, I mean, there, there was plenty of, uh, as I alluded to, we learned this, like looking at some of the letters and journals, you just, the petty things that you, you know you've just, if you've lived in a family, even a good family, you know that they exist. And certainly in a larger community of, you know, sister so-and-so, and her lying spirit, <laughs> and she like, um, kind of the kind of gossipy things you might write in a journal when you've gotten really close with people and you're up in their business a lot. But, um, and, but I was, I was, so I was thinking about gender equality, but I was also just thinking about when you have a community that's not based around um, traditional reproduction, um, that we, we learned a lot in being there, like how, um, in a sense, prosperous the community was because they had, they had like this brain trust of, even though many of the people who joined Shakers weren't very wealthy themselves, or they didn't bring a lot of money with them, or you know, huge estates they sold and, and gave to the community, but they came with all this knowledge. Right? They had they had, had trades, they had been apprenticed, they, and so then you get a group of adults, hundreds of adults working together, pooling those resources um, to solve problems for communal life, and. Um, just what a different model that is. And then you add to that a kind of, I mean, there was hierarchy in the Shaker community, but um, a, at least a gender equality, right, or an emphasis on kind of the common flourishing of the community. It's a really unique, right, it's a really unique combination or sort of cocktail um, that, that I think produces something. I, I can't think of a community, um, even the Shakers, I think now, the community around them, right, they don't, they can't live in quite that same um, that same format, and it's it does strike me as something fairly unique and long lasting. But I don't know. What do you think? I think, um, well, professionally as a religion scholar, we we try to stay away from the good religion, bad religion kind of model. Like you know, there's groups are groups of humans, and they have 
good and good and bad things about them, right? And and I think that you know to go back to my original comment, I think that many what I was remarking on is that many. Um, small religious groups actually attract attention in ways that actually make it very difficult for them to continue, right? They are actually, there's a, you know, some, some outside group, and in fact the Shakers as well, as in their very early years, attracted enormous negative attach attention. They were run out of town when they tried to, um, when Mother Ann Lee and others um, after her um, tried to um, proselytize and missionize for their group. So, um, so that how the Shakers lived, I think, was not just about how they were living in community, but how they were living with the communities that they were in. So not just how they were living within the group in, of the families in Mount Lebanon, but also their interactions with non-Shakers that were, um, you know, in the early days, not so positive, in the, at least from the Shaker's perspective, um, but they make their peace, and they made their peace with their communities through trade, through interaction, through inviting people to come and literally watch them worship um, in a way that I think seems in some ways very voyeuristic to me now. I think, gee, that wouldn't feel so good. <laughs> um, you know, but this was a large part of what the sort of the shaker openness. Um, one of the other things that I learned with my students we, um, who were doing some poking around in the online archives that are available at the Shaker Museum's online collection, they learned about these people called the Winter Shakers, um, who um, were people who, in the wintertime when it got cold <laughs> and there wasn't that much to eat, they would sort of join up for the winter and they were welcomed by the community to come and to live and to, um, and to eat. And then when things got a little bit better in the springtime, they would move on their way. And so the, there's a generosity, um, you know, perhaps part of this is because of desire for survival and not wanting to attract the negative attention that might otherwise come with their rather radical plans for celibate living and, you know, an, a sort of explosion of the nuclear family. Um, but also part of it, I think, was a genuine desire for um, making the community um, extending the kingdom of heaven beyond their own boundaries and into the world, um, in, in, in the world outside of their boundaries, yeah. Um, could we go to the audience? Anybody, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. I have two. I'll do one at a time. Um, the, was there a predisposition to welcoming um, the, the legacy of the spirits of the past? Let me just repeat that just for the, the everyone else, because we can't pass around microphones in, in the pandemic time. Just w what was the, um, was there a predisposition for this communication with the dead, with the, 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 the faithful departed, as we say, among the, uh, among the shakers? So I mean, I'll, I'll start and anyone else can jump in, but I, um, so there's um, a period, my understanding, and I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I'm speaking accurately, but there's a period in, in Shaker history in the early part of the 19th century, so around 1830, um, when members of the Shaker community begin to have these more ecstatic um, spiritual experiences, both ecstatic in that they would they would they would they always danced ecstatically. That's actually where the term shaker came from, or pejoratively from other from outsiders. But especially visitations from dead members, um, members who'd already passed, and then it actually extended to be historical figures, um, right, uh, famous Americans, um, Native Americans who would come and speak to the shakers in in sort of dream or um, dream states or trance states, and they would give them spiritual gifts, which were sometimes invisible, like a, like um, that then could be described verbally, um, and sometimes were um, produced gift drawings. So someone under this, the influence of the spirit would, would produce a drawing um, that could then also be a gift to the community. And um, I think historians, I think that one of the major interpretations of this period is that it was the sort of the, the first generation after that had really lost touch with Mother Anne and um, all of her living compatriots. So it was the generation that really had not had any direct access to the first generation of Shakers, and that this um, this sort of era gave access to for living Shakers to communicate with Mother Anne Lee and with other um, departed Shakers. And my understanding is that that. That was, it was an intense period where this was happening a lot. It also led them to actually close their meetings down eventually. Um, they attracted a lot of outside attention, and they said, you know, look, we're going to 
we're going to stop letting other people come in and watch us or or analyze or talk about what's going on. And then that then that period sort of faded and it ceased to be as prominent. It was never repudiated, right, as now we don't believe in that or now that never happens. And my sense is that Shakers, even through the modern period, continue to speak. I mean, I think even in the Ken Burns documentary, some of them talk about continued dream yeah, experience. Yeah, and also in the sort of later 1800s when there was this, you know, surge of spiritualism in, in the nation, they were, the Shakers were very interested in that, and they saw that as an opportunity to sort of proselytize to those audiences. So, you know, when they would, they would actually go to conferences on kind of, you know, like spiritualism and see that as a, as a potential, you know, potential convert <laughs> kind of situation. So, no, I don't think they ever lost that interest in, um, in communicating with, with um, the other, other world, so to speak. Do you have a, uh, a second question, you said? Uh, yeah. Um, it never occurred to me the connection between childlessness and industriousness, mm -hmm. uh, which is not unlike, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Roman Catholic, which is not unlike my experience with Roman Catholic orders, priests, mm -hmm. nuns, and the like. Um, if, if it's accepted so widely, well, maybe not so much in this era, but if it's accepted so widely that childlessness is akin to industriousness, why did it, and I'm going to use a term incorrectly, why is it dying out? There's a, a question just about the childlessness, the this new, you know, celibate community and industriousness, and what was the connection there, and why did it die out? You're talking about why did it die out with the Shakers, not, yeah. Well, I mean, there was a couple, couple major factors there. Um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of post-Civil War with the rise of industrialism in, in the U.S., uh, you know, the economy started to change. There were more jobs. There were, it's gotten to the 20th century. Women had more options. They were allowed to own property, for instance, which they weren't and when the Shakers were founded. So, so you know, just, there became a wider range of options um, for, for men and women. And you'll see that there was actually a um, kind of a, a Exodus of men out of the Shaker communities in the late late 19th century because they could go work in factories and and things like that. And as the communities were in decline, there really were it was predominantly women. Um, but also uh, the the Shakers would take in um, take in orphans and they would raise them to be Shakers and they would turn 18 and they get an opportunity to either stay or go. Um, but the laws around the 19th, turn of the, the century um, changed and it didn't, you couldn't just like drive your wagon up and pick up a bunch of orphans. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, there just, there were a lot of changes happening in the greater world that, uh, that made celibacy not, you know, and joining the Shakers not the only option in order to kind of have a, uh, you know, a economically prosperous life. Well, can I pick up on that? And why did the Shakers succeed originally? Was it a purely, not purely, but largely utilitarian in the sense that, you know, there were so many children in need of play? Was it a refuge in a sense above all? Or was it, you know, a, a spiritual attraction or, or both? Well, I think, I think it's all of that. I mean, I think that if you were kind of living hand to mouth, you know, in the countryside and you, you would take your, your wheat to be uh, ground at the Shaker's, you know, grist mill, you're like, wow, these people have it pretty good. <laughs> you know, so there was just kind of like a material attraction. And, and you know, I think that if you weren't really interested in having a, a, you know, a nuclear family, if you had some reason that that was not appealing to you, this was another alternative for you, and I, I really think that um, they thrived because these women could be full participants in their in their society. If any other questions, just raise your hand and I'll call on you. One thing I wanted to pick up on was I love your line about um, Shakerism leading to IKEA, <laughs> and we we didn't go deeply into that, and there was a lot of discussions about that. But again. Um, can you talk about, and you or Courtney, or all, all of you, you're, you're, any of you, um, you know, about the, um, oh, just as a sidebar, the, the part with Ellie Kim and the pop-up thing, and, and uh, the young woman um, in Chatham at the pop-up exhibit there, and that shoe. She was a wonderful, lovely interview, 
And she was talking about, it was, you know, a really mod, as we used to say, platform shoe. And all the people would come by and say, that's so cool, so fashionable. And she's like, no, it's made for somebody with, it's, a, it's made for somebody who has a shorter leg. So I, that really is one of the most, I think, um, sort of uh, insightful passages of the whole thing, of the way we interpret what the Shakers did and the way the Shakers interpreted what they made. But again, um, how is that design legacy been exploited or dumbed down or, or whatever? How would you, you know, how did we get from Shakerism to Ikea? Well, we have an, we had an art historian um, on our project who's actually wor working, continuing to work as a curator for the Shaker Museum and she would, she wrote on like the influence of... She connected all the dots. She connected all the dots. Just, 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 just. Um, but it, I mean, the um, short answer is that in the 20th century, um, um, American art historians and and design people kind of separate from each other and then connected, kind of rediscovered the Shakers um, and Shaker material culture, which hadn't disappeared, but like sort of rediscovered them and re and saw in them as early progenitors of a kind of modernist style of sort of form-fitting function. Um, and so there, influ there is influence, right, of kind of re looking at the Shakers as sort of proto-modernist, American modernist, just like Americans, Americans have modernism too. It's we're not, just, we're not just Europeans. We have our <laughs> own tradition, um, and seeing the Shakers there, and then and then actually they're German and Danish designers being also influenced by the Shakers, which is the roundabout way that we get like Shaker influence on Bauhaus and then Shaker influence on other so designs. It went from here to the Danish modern yeah, kind of. Yeah, definitely. Danish modern, you can trace it back directly to a Shaker chair that somehow drifted over to, to Europe and ended up in a in a, coll a college or university collection. Everyone's like, what is this chair? <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty interesting story and it's also, you know, it continues to really resonate with people because we get a lot of designers, uh, makers and artists that come, they want to come and access the collection and they're, you know, some of them are taking inspiration directly from the forms and, you know, we get into conversations with them and it's, um, you know, a lot of makers are trying to think, how do I express my values and what I'm what I'm making and what I'm designing? You know, if I believe in community or sustainability or whatever, and the Shakers were doing that all along. So not only is it kind of an aesthetic um, uh, inspiration for them, but just like how do you integrate these things? How do you integrate your belief system or your ethos into the material culture that you're producing? Can I ask a question? Um, well, I w no, I wondered if maybe, because I know Courtney's been thinking a lot about religion and museums, and you're obviously always thinking about religion and museums in this particular case, but maybe um, if you could talk, either one of you or both of you, talk about sort of how you're, where your thinking is now in terms of how, would, how does a museum try to embody, sort of what you were just saying, right, embody that relationship between material culture and the religious values, the theological commitments of the of the people who made them. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can say that in in the planning for Shaker Museum, the new Shaker Museum, um, you know, we're. I mean, I think I think what's compelling in in any of the situations is storytelling, right? So you're always trying to tell a compelling story, and and you know, you're not. In a story that's that's um, that's engaging and that you're asking questions at the same time that you're, you're sort of providing some answers. So um, you know, as we work with um, Maggie, who was I unfortunately couldn't be here to talk about that shaker chair and how it got to Europe, um, but you know, as we work on on with her on curating the ex permanent exhibition in the new building, we're really thinking how do we engage the community? How do we how do we not just kind of S, you know, sit on high and, and pass down the the fascinating information that we have. You know how do how do we, how do we um, how do we learn together with our audiences and with our community? And how do you provide that space? And I think you've been thinking a little bit about that in a in a beyond just Shaker Museum. Right. I so so one of the things that in um, 
that I've been thinking a lot about with and along with many other people is the ways that we often tend to think first about religion as being about belief or about sort of a mental construct or sort of a viewpoint. Um, and leaving the material aspects of religion as a sort of secondary, like it emanates from that or it's a representation or a symbol of those beliefs rather than as sort of itself religion being about material culture and being about the things that people hold dear and the work that they do to, to make these things or even to use them, um, whether they're ritual objects or everyday objects, that we can really think about um, that we need, in fact, I think, to understand, in order to understand how people live religiously, we need to be able to, it, we, meaning scholars and museum people, need to be able to tell the religious stories of objects and not just that religious people made these objects, but there are in fact religious stories to the objects. And so that sounds maybe a little abstract, but um, you know, to think about Shaker, um, uh, for example, just um, Maggie was um, explaining to some of us recently that um, Shaker's understandings and ideas, I'm gonna start now from ideas, but from ideas about order, um, were expressed in the ways that they color-coded their objects. Um, so that objects in the community um, were color, had were painted different colors um, depending on ideas about order, ideas about their relationship, their presence and their, their moving about in heaven on earth that they were creating. So when you look at a shaker object um, to um, not say, oh, well these ideas like are then sort of manifested in this way, but like here, this object, is really a physical manifestation for a shaker of being part of the kingdom of heaven right here, right now, part of this beloved community. So, um, so that's the exciting thing about working with the shaker museum uh, groups that are working with this and really sort of trying to, you know, bring the multiplicity of these objects as design pieces, as gorgeous aesthetic objects, as things that actual people made and that also that are so religiously infused in themselves. So bringing all that into the exhibition space is um, a challenge, but I think I'm just very excited about what the conversations. I'm very excited. I'm very excited to see this someday, soon, I hope. Not to knock, not to knock Ikea, but having put together enough of those things in my day. I'm not sure we'll be talking in the same depth. Uh, it's of, not of, living of, among the kingdom uh, of God. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, or or at least not for the two years that they last, you know? I mean, oh, yeah, see, I, Shakers would, would very much disapprove. <laughs> they're, too, things are, they're too heavy and they don't last. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was really true, but it, you know, again, not to knock it, they, one represents a certain ethos in a certain period and Ikea represents a different ethos in a different period. Uh, Lacey, you also, uh, just, and we have to wrap up in a, in a couple of minutes, um, it's not just uh, objects. You also have a, hu a great trove of, of uh, written materials, which are fascinating as well. Yeah, the, um, we have the records of the Central Ministry, which uh, Mount Lebanon and everybody, Central Ministry. Yes, I know. I <laughs> yes, <laughs> I always. Everybody who's been around me for very long knows that I always say it's like the Jerusalem and the Vatican of the Shaker world. Um, the the you know the the Mount Lebanon really operated as the um, uh, as the nexus through around which all the other communities were um, were arranged. So it made all the major decisions and then kind of communicated them out. So um, all the official records of um, of Mount Lebanon and that central ministry came to Shaker Museum in the 1960s. So it's it's a I mean it's an extraordinary and totally unique record of um, you know dating back to the to the um, 1700s of that community and, and you know the diaries can be extremely like oh we went out and we picked um, 52 bushels of onions you know to like how are we going to deal with um, you know some some major theological question within our community how do you how do you um, display those or how do you use them in a, in a museum setting yeah that's a that's a good question because they're not the, visually they're not that compelling often and you know it makes they're hard to display because you can't have them under light for very long so I think um, I think it's more about the depth of research that's being done in order to illuminate those materials and and relate them to the objects that will be shown 
Well, I'm very excited to, to see when the, the, the museum becomes a reality. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, collection, believe me, having seen, been privileged to see a bit of it. And I just want to uh, thank our panelists, Catherine Reckless, Courtney Bender, Lacey Schutz, for being here tonight. Thank you all for being part of this, uh, for this conversation and for watching our film. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.